Hey, I'm Alex Rackler from Board Game Co, and this is going to be a minor gameplay run through plus first impressions review of Spiles and Spires and Hildegard. Now, Spires End, if you're watching this, there's like a day left on the Kickstarter to back this, although there may be late pledges, so that's always an option. I'll have links down below, but I got this late campaign, so hence me diving into it now. Now, I've already gone through this story twice. This will be my third run through, and I will be trying to uh, choose different choices to figure out what goes on and how the story continues to diversify and branch depending on what I do. Now, for context here, just so you're aware, Spire's End is going to be primarily be a bit of a choose your own adventure situation. We're going to draw some cards, have some gear, make choices along the way, occasionally engage in fights. Technically, I roll that at the end of the fight. Occasionally engage in fights, trying to match up symbols with my trusty slingshot to attack various people or influence them as it were. It's not, you know, a dungeon crawler so much as that pesky merchant stole my shoe. So that kind of thing. Uh, the game is going to have multiple chapters of which I only have... The first chapter of that so I don't have a full gameplay experience here I have a bit of a trial run and with that let's go ahead and begin now there will be minor spoilers inherently the nature of what I'm doing is I'm going through a story making choices in that story if you want to skip all of that then well I mean let's let's start off the bat and in a second we'll start time stamping where you can skip to the next situation so begin here we're going to choose one of the three starting cards I'm going to choose now this one I'm choosing blindly so hopefully this is different than the last time it is. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so we have four the count. You hold your breath and aim. You've never seen a midnight squirrel, let alone right out your window. That pelt is worth a fortune. Hildegard, Halvig, your intrusive sister, barges in and hands you a package. This must go to the Count of Seacrest Cliffs. How exciting, right? Your first assignment. Since the day is finally here, I thought you might want this. It was your aunt's compass. It could be useful out on the trail, she says. Gain three gold. I'm going to gather three gold into my reserves over here. Pull card 85, then 88, 89, and 90. Now, so something I've already noticed from my second playthrough is there's definitely going to be some overlap in the choices you make. Let's go ahead and find 85, 88. Now, there are differences as well, but there's definitely some overlap even when you choose different pathways. 88, 89, and 90. Place the compass in your inventory and then choose. So again, this part's not really that spoilery, except for the fact that you're seeing this card over here. But we have Hildegard over here. Hildegard is going to Hildegard. I don't know why I'm saying Hildegard. Hildegard is going to be over here, and we're going to put things below her inventory. So we have a slingshot and pebbles. This is going to be our trusted slingshot that allows us to actually shoot people. You're going to slide things underneath your inventory like so. We have the mysterious package. You pick up the package and turn it over. It's wrapped in paper with some light markings here and there. You don't recognize them. As much as you would like to give it a shake, you don't. Well, not yet. Wonder if you ever know its contents? For now, it will remain a mystery. Well, you see, that's interesting because I think they told me it's already a compass. Now, in some of the pathways, it actually is a mystery. Midnight Squirrel. Ooh, okay, so apparently we have to... Um, What's going on with the Midnight Squirrel? Oh, the Midnight Pelt plays the compass. This is card 85. Pull card 85. Are we fighting this this thingy? Oh, we're fighting the nice squirrel. Cool. Okay, let's go ahead and fight the squirrel. So let's go ahead and show you how a fight plays out before we continue down this choose your own adventure storyline. This is going to be the amount of hits we need to attack that you need to get to get that squirrel, or in which case we would get the pelt. This is going to be the accuracy is how many dice we roll, and the sets are how many times we get to roll. Now this is going to have a classic you know, roll dice, make sets. So we can only use those two symbols to make sets. That's going to be that part over there. So we're going to use this symbol over here. And every time you roll, you must keep at least one, but you can keep as many as you want. So I'm going to keep that one because that's necessary to make sets. We're going to go ahead and roll that. Beautiful. But there's a one third chance we get what we want there and we did not. Now we are going to roll the wild die at the end of each set and boom, that's going to be two bullseyes in my first set. We're going to do it again. Let's see if we can do it again. That was not, this not be rolled. That was not good though. I'm going to waste that over there and hope for the best. This is not looking, oh, that is really not looking good. I'm not going to get the squirrel. I am definitely not getting the squirrel no matter what happens now. And I get that finally. I roll this and we get that. So I've gotten two hits out of the four I require, which means um, this is going to be discarded. So we're going to go ahead and leave that. I'll just go ahead and leave that underneath here. And let's go ahead and choose a pathway. So we can grab the mercantile pathway or the breakfast pathway. So this is where, and then we're going to put the compass in my inventory. I think I'm going to go mercantile this time around. So, and I actually, let's see, mercantile, eight, 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 eight. Um, you know what? I think, see, I've done both the mercantile and the breakfast. I, if I recall, mm, 
I think I'm going to go back to breakfast because I want to choose something different than the last time. So breakfast is going to be card two, which is going to be the Hungry Hog. Before embarking into the wild, you decide in a hearty breakfast that the Hungry Hog is in order. You haven't eaten since yesterday and your stomach is growling. Farfully, the barkeep asks what you'll have. So last time, I chose porridge and coffee because why wouldn't I? This time round, I think I'm going to go with dried fruit and nuts. It's great for a journey. Nuts and nibbles. Far, farfully gives you an extra helping of trail mix for the road. It's an assortment of seeds, nuts, dried fruits, and a touch of chocolate nibbles. Why is my camera not focusing? There we go. A touch of chocolate nibbles. Pay one gold for breakfast. Place the trail mix into your inventory. Ask farfully for directions or get an early start. Ooh, directions for sure. Why would I not want directions here? Okay. And we're going to go ahead and put the trail mix into our inventory so we have that in case it's relevant later. Different cards will interact with, well, different cards. The Helping Hana. Helping Hannah. Before you can wave down Farfully, Hannah, the establishment's owner, comes through the front door. She's struggling to carry a large burlap sack. You can't help but notice that the bag is wiggling a bit. You decide to lend a hand. The two of you lug it back out to her herb, herb garden behind the tavern. Hannah, what's in the bag, or what's the best way to coast? I don't want to be uh, in her business. That's her business. I'm going to go ahead and just ask her what's the best way to the coast. By the way, if I didn't say so already, there are timestamps if you want to skip directly to the first impressions review part. Fast Passage. Hannah, which way would you take to the coast? Hickory Hills would be best, but it's just cornfields. It's, not, it's just cornfields. Now, the pass through Pointy Peaks is a bit shorter, but there's beers and the bridge at Beak Falls was swept away in the rain. I'd avoid it if you can. Either way, the paths meet up at Blister Bridge. From there, it's a straight shot to Crow Falls. Try and catch a ride in the river to the coast, but beware of river pirates. Madeline the, May, Madeline the Mad has cost me a lot of money. Come to think of it, keep an eye around here as well. There have been reports of cloaked figures roaming the streets, she says under her breath. You thank her for the advice. Continue on your way. I'm going to keep that to the side because that might be relevant. Okay, continue to card 16. We have Forlorn Lover. As you make your way through the outskirts of town, you find a man weeping on a lonely street corner. He looks at you with puffy red eyes. By the way, this arc that I'm doing, I haven't explored yet. Uh, my two previous games, I want to say I explored roughly 25 or so cards each play out of this stack over here. So there's a lot of content here that you don't necessarily explore in a single run. As you make your way through the outskirts of town, you find a man weeping on a lonely street corner. He looks at you with puffy red eyes. I don't suppose you're a good shot with that there slingshot, he asks. Shoulder, shoulder shrugged. You're hesitant. And by the way, apparently, no, I'm not a good shot. There's something off with this guy, but curiosity is killing you. Mmm. No. No. When something is, when something is off, my curiosity is not that, that potent. It's just for looks, sorry. I'm not gonna help him. I'm not gonna get involved because if my senses are saying something's off, you gotta, you gotta listen to yourself. Listen to your heart. There's nothing else you can do. Good fortune. As you cross Main Street and head west, you hear someone calling your name. Hildegard, it's all around town that you're carrying something of interest. You need not, you need to keep your eyes open and watch your back. It's about time you had a reading, suggests Martin, Mar Marin, the renowned local fortune teller. Standing in the doorway, she urges you forward with a wave. Now, this is a good example of a car that has crossed pathways before. Despite my different arc one way, I'm touching base with a good fortune card again. So that means it's time for a different choice. Last time, I absolutely did not want my fortune read. I'm not into that gobbly gook stuff over there. But this time, okay, please don't curse me. Card 53. Curses. Sit down and relax, Hildegard, she says in a soothing voice. Marin lights a candle as you take a seat. Between the two of you is a smoky yellow crystal and some gruesome knickknacks, probably to set the mood. Additionally, cur additional curiosities hanging from the ceiling and oozing out of jars. Are you relaxed? Are you ready? Ready for what? Good. Let's begin. The surrounding candles blow out and the air grows cold. Madame's Rules Marin raises her hands and the dull yellow crystal on the table begins to levitate. Marin's body splits into three astral projections. This is actually not gobbledygook. This is pretty cool. Pull out and shuffle the next three cards. The 56s. Place all 56s up. So this is going to be some things you'll see whenever it shows another card, the number multiple times. It means there are multiple instances of that card. All cards are treated as separate targets. Put them all face up. Whoa! There's three astral projections here. All three cards are treated as separate targets. You may attack them in the order you choose. Roll shot dice normally for each target. If one is defeated, flip that card over and look for a dot in the bottom right corner. If it's there, it's the real Marin. If not, it's an illusion. The encounter ends when you find the real Marin or when you run out of rolls before you do. Cool. Okay, we're going to attack the rightmost one first because that's almost certainly the real Marin. Okay, we're going to roll four dice. Yep, we got four dice here. Three hits is all we need, and we can use any of these combinations, which makes it a little easier. So we're going to keep that one, because that could result in a nice combo there. 
Uh, that's going to keep another one of those, which is not looking good for me. Oh, okay, good. So we got one hit there. And we got nothing. So we got one hit. We're going to roll that one. That's going to negate a result. We'll negate that. So we have one bullseye. That combines to get a bullseye. And we have one more set to get the remaining two bullseyes. Like I said, I'm not good at rolling dice. This does not get rolled. I'm going to keep that. And I'm going to keep that. That already gives us a bullseye. And then we got that. And I'm going to hope for a circle. Nope. Okay. So now I have two bullseyes. And I need this to be a bullseye. Oh, ho, ho. yeah. So apparently I failed. Again, I'm not a good shot. Fail, card 58. We'll never know which one was the real card projection. Okay, card 58 is going to be over here. We're going to go ahead and failed fortune. The illusions of Marin fade away, leaving her seated across the table. I've tried to help you in more ways than one. You have no idea. Some things take more than a burning desire. You need an instinct that can't be taught. Sadly, child, you don't have that. At least not yet. You can feel it too as you reluctantly hand her the package. Not to worry. I see a bright future ahead, but this particular delivery isn't part of it. Be thankful you finally saw me. Trigv, can you please take this back to the Ministry? Let them know that another selection needs to be made, she states. Yes, indeed, a little man with a top hat and spectacles emerges from behind Marin. Ending 6. So, that was the quickest game of Spires and Hildegard that I've played yet, but apparently I am a terrible shot, and that is a... Uh, that is embarrassing. Well, the good news is you don't have to sit through uh, 45 minutes of me playing this game on camera and you got a fairly short introduction to the Rural of the Spires and Hildegard. The, ba Hildegard. the bad news is that was the shortest game I've played yet. So let's go into this my overview so far of the game based on my plays so far. Now, the reason I'm calling this, you know, play through first impressions rather than a review is while I will be reviewing it and giving you my opinion, it is based on a single chapter and... I don't know how much more of the game I have to experience to really get a full feel for how this game plays out. So let's go into the th various sections I usually do, what I liked, didn't like, can see others not liking, and all of that. To begin with, the art is gorgeous. Love the art. Uh, the art really pulls you in. I know that this is the second game in a series. They have the original Spire's End. This is a different one. This one has a totally different feel to the artwork, to the look. I have not played the original, so I can't comment on that past what I've seen about it. But this one really just pulls you in beautifully. I mean, the, the art, is the art, the color scheme, all of that is really, really well done in the game. The story is excellent. Every single time I've played, I have felt like I'm actually choosing where I want to go, what I want to do, and I'm often invested in the outcome. Now, I can't roll dice for Jack. I've learned that the hard way multiple times. I cannot, my slingshot, I'm not good at the slingshot, unfortunately. So any single time I've encountered anyone, whether it's, you know, the the peddler, whether it's uh, the, the guy running off with the thing, I'm not going to tell you what the thing is, whether it's the crows, whether it's the Marin over here, I have been pretty bad at rolling dice. I've won some combats, but not the ones that seem to matter the most. I, I tend to lose those combats and either die horrific deaths or just have elderly women supremely disappointed in me, which is not that different than my actual life, come to think of it. But that aside, so the story, the story, I really enjoy the story so far, and at least based on my plays so far, I enjoy how branching the story is. Each of my plays, well, this is actually going to be the fewest cards I've pulled so far, but each of my plays I have pulled, again, I want to guesstimate that when you count this one, I got want to guesstimate I've pulled between 15 and 30 cards in a play. That's how many cards there are. There's, I, don't, I haven't actually counted them, but it looks like there's roughly 70, 80 cards in this, and that's chapter one. I believe the full Spires and Hildegard comes with, I believe it's four chapters, and the amount of branching pathways, stories, narratives you can potentially devise there would be... Excellent. Uh, as a solo game, I am really enjoying how quick and easy this is to table and play, and even setup and cleanup, because setup is non-existent, let's be honest. There's, there's no setup whatsoever. You pull this, you grab some tokens, you're good to go. Cleanup is going to be a bit more. You're going to have to go ahead and, you know, draw this out and start figuring out, okay, card 85, let's start with top over here, card 2, card 1 is going to go on top of card there. We're going to go ahead and take one from over here as well. That's not one. We want to grab the, is there another one here? This one, nope, there's a one somewhere. Here we go, here we go, put that there. You're going to need to go through these over here, slotting your cards in as you go, finding where you, you know, path, your journey, your pathway out. So there is a degree of cleanup. Now, with 25 cards and with your journey generally going in order, I have not found it to be unnecessarily problematic. So take Seventh Continent is going to be a good example of a game that I love. I love Seventh Continent. Uh, I think it's excellent, but I hate the amount of cleanup and the slotting things back. As far as end, so far, at least based on my experiences, 
you're talking about maybe four to five minutes of cleanup, uh, possibly even less. I'd argue even less. Like, I mean, looking at this now, I could probably get this done. You know what? At the end of the video, I'll just clean up all these cars and you'll see how long a cleanup would be of a roughly 10 minute of adventure and how much cleanup that translates into. So you can get a feel for that at the end of this video. And that will be roughly equitable. You know, if you have twice as many cars, twice as long an adventure, then add twice as long cleanup. So it's there, it's present. It is something worth noting as a negative, but it's not necessarily over the top. So as a solo journey, I've really enjoyed it. I have not played it two player so far. I, I, I There is a two player mode where you pull out your sister, you pull out uh, Hal, Hal, Halveg, Halveg, you pull out Halveg over there and she joins you in the adventure. You share some dice, you make decisions together. It seems like a tact on on two player mode. Ultimately the two of you still have to make choices together. You're just experiencing the journey together and they give you an additional character with her trusted boomerang that will help you I feel like you're more in the game than just, you know, making decisions together. So it's there, it's present. I imagine it's a bit tacked on, but if you want to go through this journey together, and tacked on might be the wrong word. It's not like a full character arc and journey. You make decisions together, you roll dice separately. That's what the two-player mode has. It's nice if you want to experience that journey together, but otherwise it's not going to give you a full, you know, choices of agency and all of that. This is not a branching path storyline as you go through it. Mechanics. Well, before we get to mechanics, let's see. So I covered most of what I liked, talked a bit about the cleanup. Anything else I like about this game? It's simple, it's quick, it teaches in five minutes, it plays in so far, and again, if you do a chapter by chapter, it plays in so far between 10 and 25 minutes per chapter. The more fighting you're doing, the more it's going to extend it. A single card can take a minute to play through. A single fight might add two minutes to the game. So every fight is going to further enhance it, especially when you're fighting the full face-off. So we haven't shown you that mechanic, but there's more of a mechanic of a full face-off where the enemy's attacking you, you're attacking the enemy, as opposed to having a limited number of sets. Those fights are more fun. There's more strategy in those fights, more anything, but they also add to the game time. Not a bad thing, they just add to the game time. So I think that covers most of the things I like about Spires and, Spires and Hildegard so far. As far as what I don't like about the game, it's going to be fairly minimal, but it's worth noting. So to begin with the cleanup, small nitpick, not a big deal, but it certainly is something to be mindful of, that at the end of your 20 minute adventure, there's going to be two minutes of slotting cards back into their respective spots. The biggest thing about this game that I don't particularly love is going to be the, the dice rolling. The dice rolling is going to be the mechanic in this game that takes it from a pure choose your own adventure story to having a gameplay mechanic at play. There are other some small things. There's going to be choices you make along the way as to where to spend your gold. You'll pull out different equipment or you'll visit the mercantile and you'll grab a bunch of stuff and gear and you'll put it out and they'll choose. I have three gold and I can get that one thing that costs three or I can get those two things. That one costs two. That one costs one. Maybe I should just get the one that costs two and save my one for later, by the way. I should have done that that one time because I would have actually gotten the cool thing later that only cost me one gold. So there's going to be a bit of resource decisions around your resources. Uh, these tokens over here, in case you're wondering what they're for, are for if I get into those larger fights to mark wounds as I go. But yeah, these tokens over here, the resource management of where to spend your gold, how to spend your gold, what gear you get, and how that affects future fights, that's going to be a degree of mechanical integration that I do like. It's nice. I like decisions in games. The same decision as to go left or right versus to buy this equipment or that equipment adds to my investment in the story and the narrative and how it plays out. What I don't love is going to be the dice rolling as a mechanic in the game to keep you invested primarily because I've rarely found there to be any interesting decisions to be made. The dice rolling represents the fights you have. You're trying to influence a merchant, you're trying to fight off the crows, you're trying to fight off three astral projections floating in the air in front of you, and you roll the dice, and you match up the dice with whatever allowed results there are, and you keep what you can keep. Look at that. That's going to be a bullseye. I'll keep both of those. Let's roll again. There's very few to interesting decisions. There's few to no decisions to be made in here that are actually of interest. The fact that you hypothetically have the illusion of a decision does not make it a decision. When I have these dice, watch, let's just play it out. Okay, I roll that. I can choose one of two things over here. I can choose this half symbol over here. I can choose this blank, or I can choose one of these dots. Now, I'm going to choose a dot because I have to choose something. And this I'd require three of these, one of these, one of the other ones, and a dot in order to make a face. So I'm going to keep this one over here because that is inherently the, the going to tear up with one other face to give me a thing. Now I could keep this one, that would be arguably a decision, but it's unlikely they're going to roll two of these on the others, so I'm going to keep one of these. That doesn't really seem like a decision, it seems like the obvious play. Now over here, again, not a decision, I'm going to keep these two because they tear up to a bullseye. And then this one I'm going to re-roll because it's not a bullseye, there's no decision to be made here, and then that's there. And then I roll the wild die and I get a bullseye. Yes, two bullseyes for that set. Not bad. 
I've rarely, if ever, felt that I was making a decision when rolling these dice in the game. And that is slightly bothersome. I still go through the emotions. I still go through it to see if I, whether I won or lost, but there's minimal decision making around those sets that you make. It's not like you're complicated doing the odds. You choose the best dice results. You move on. Where there is a drop of decision making is the concept of feats. You're going to have these various feats of marksmanship, marksmanship you can earn during the game as you go through the journey. And then at times you can choose to spend a feat to re-roll or whatnot. Choosing when to spend that resource, again, that resource engine aspect, the choice of where your resources go, that will have some degree of agency over your battles. Like, oh, this is, looks like an important battle. I don't want to lose this one. So then you want that. Now, sometimes it's not necessarily a problem because sometimes the game is not necessarily failing so much as choosing two divergent pathways. Other times, as you saw in this playthrough, it's actually failing. So the fact that the key gameplay mechanic in the game that turns it from a choose your own adventure to a game with choose your own adventure, the fact that that is just dice rolling with minimal to no agency, I do not love at all. Now, also to be fair, I haven't encountered a variety of, let's say, effects or gear or different things that augment my dice results and give me more agency there. So it's entirely possible that as the game develops, as you make your way through different chapters, and chapters, by the way, act as save points. So you can save your gear, you write it down, and then if you fail a new chapter, you can go back to the end of the last chapter, reset your gear to where you left off, continue through it as you go. So the fact that you might be able to augment, level up your character, and potentially give you more agency, that is entirely possible. It's not something I've experienced, but that is going to be my main and only real con of Aspires and Hildegard. As far as final thoughts for this game, at least based on my plays so far. So like I said, three plays in so far, all in chapter one, and did not go to chapter two, three, or four, because I don't have those. But I'm really enjoying this game. But with the caveat, you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. This is a fun little game to pull out, at least for me. For me, this is a fun game to pull out to play when I have 15, 25 minutes, and I just want something that's not going to have a large degree of setup or tear down. I just want to go through something. My choices are a book, a rule book, pulling out Sprawlopolis, or Spires and Hildegard. I think it very much does have a spot in my collection in that sense. It has a spot in my collection in the sense of being a narrative game that is the smallest and most accessible narrative game I've seen or played to date. If I were rating this one, it would be hard. It would be somewhere between a three and a four on my scale. Ones, for context, my scale is ones are bad games. Twos are games that are not for me or have too many flaws. Threes are good games. Fours are great games. And fives are the very best games in my collection. This, to me, would be a three or four, depending on me continuing to play through the game. The base game... I like the narrative, I do, I enjoy going through it, but it also gives me minimal mechanical choice past just going through a storybook and playing out a choose your own adventure. As the game develops and as multiple chapters present things, I could very much see this going up because I like what it's doing. I want that, I want that main mechanic to matter more. I want to feel like I have more agency in the main mechanic of the game of rolling dice to actually attack people. And so that's basically my review, first impressions, playthrough of Spires and Hildegard. Until next time, well, first of all, link down below to the Kickstarter so you can check that out. Like I said already, you have a day left or something like that. Not a lot of time, but potentially late pledges. I have no idea. But other than that, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And until next time, have a good one. And I forgot to clean up, so now I can do the cleanup part. So, clean up. We're at 2450 seconds. Let's go ahead and clean this up. We have card 10 over here. Card 10 is going to go here. Card 3... Is going to go here we have what do we have here just making sure they're usually roughly in order but just in case so let's go to the 50s so when you go to card 50 or so 52 is where we're headed so 52 53 we have 54 here 55 then we have 56 56 56 and that's going to be that then we have 85 down there 85 is going to be a little over here 82 83 84 85 87, 88, we have 90 over here, nope, not 90's there, 90 and 89, 90 and 89, and this closes off the bottom. So yeah, you can see over there, I cheated by putting out cards, that was roughly a minute of cleanup for 10 minutes of gameplay. Hope that was helpful.